Hey, what is up everyone? It's Rich. All right, welcome to another Inktober uh, video. What I'm going to do today is I'm going to show how to work with a crow quill and some techniques that I use and you know, kind of the versatility of the tool. And then I had a really good question. I It was funny because for Inktober, one of the things that I wanted to hit on was actually um, like self-preservation of yourself as an artist, meaning like physically and mentally being able to um, work a pretty demanding um, job and uh, not injure yourself. <laughs> so uh, I, I'm going to read the question that I got, um, but I honestly, it was it was perfect timing because I, I had a short list of things that I thought I would touch on during Inktober, and one of them was actually like, you know, hand-related injuries, eyes, your back. And also um, just uh, like dealing with the stress of the job. So let me read the question really quick. I have to turn around so my voice might get quieter for a second, but I'll try to project. So it says, hey, Rich, just wanted to ask if you've ever had any experience with art related injuries. You know, the RSIs and carpal tunnel. I actually don't know what RSI is, but maybe that's like um, a repetitive stress syndrome or something like that. I'm not an... I'm not an inker slash comic artist, but have been getting work as a freelance illustrator in dealing with a mild injury I got in June um, and has been the biggest thing slowing me down. Obviously, if you don't want to touch on this since it's medical, I understand that. Um, then he uh, was very complimentary about the channel and, and um, me, uh, you know, like like encouraging people to, to draw. And I get that a lot, and it's awesome. It really is great. So uh, if you follow my channel and uh, it's inspired you to even draw for, you know, 20 or 30 minutes a day, I'm, I'm super, super happy and flattered. Look, my cat is super happy and flattered, too. Hi. What are you doing? Okay, so I'm gonna talk, and uh, I'll start inking a little bit. But let me. I'm gonna. I'm gonna talk about um, the injury stuff first, and then I'll get into the. Um, I'll have a timestamp if people want to switch, uh, skip the, um, the you know like injury related uh, stuff. So so uh, the number one thing that kept circling back to me when I was actually kicking this around is um, the stress of the job. It's really, really fucking stressful. And it didn't used to be for me. When I worked at um, Wildstorm specifically, when Wildstorm was was its own thing. I, you know what, though? That's not actually true. Because um, there was some pretty gnarly times. Um, so this is what I would say is is comic books is a little out of your control. The only way that you can really fully, fully control kind of things is, is if you... 100% self-publish, but even then, I mean, you're just going to deal with stuff. I'm just kind of warming up, I guess, I while, while we chit-chat, um, when I'm in focus. Um, but, uh, yeah, you know, one of the very first books that I worked on was just brutally late. I mean, I, I was the very first thing that I was going to ink, and I, I think we had to do, like, man... A full book in five days, something crazy like that. It was an issue of union. It was myself and Pop Man. And, uh, it, I mean, Pop almost died. Honestly, we were working on it one night at Wildstorm, and he thought he was going to have a heart attack. So this is why I, I actually am hitting the stress part of it first. Because uh, when I was working on Batman Dark Knight with David Finch for the new 52. I knew I've, I, I've told the story a few times in like journey of a thousand miles videos. I knew that that launch was going to be a fucking meat grinder. Like if it was, it was like the D day for like DC artists. It was, I knew it was going to annihilate. I think they launched, I don't know. Was it 52 books? I, I knew for a fact that, that most people would never ever see their 12th issue of the comic book. Um, and it was just going to literally decimate teams because most people can't do monthly work. So Finch and I went into it and, uh, we're pretty like hardcore. Both David and I have been around the block and done stuff that takes longer. And we've also done stuff that's monthly. David gets a rap for not being, um, uh, on time, or at least when, when I first started working with him, um, that I would catch wind of people kind of saying stuff like that. I worked with him on and off for three years and he was pretty, he was pretty reliable and, you know, he brought it. I, I would, I would disagree with the, uh, the sentiment that he can't um, do monthly work. I know that he's had times where he hasn't, but anyway, 
Um, so while we were starting either the second or third issue, like I got like a batch of pages from him and I've been working really, really hard. And I, I had like an anxiety attack or like a panic attack one day in the morning. Like I was just looking at the page and how much work I had, how much work was left in the book, what the deadline was. And I went in the kitchen and I literally thought I was going to (laughs) die. I'm kidding. Like I've had panic attacks before, but it was like, I was like, I'm going to have a heart attack. I'm going to fucking die. I'm going to be dead on the ground. And like, someone's going to come home later during the day and just find me fucking gone. Um, and so, you know, when you have an anxiety attack like that, it takes you a while to recover. It's not like when it goes away, you're just like, Oh, okay. Like I can just kind of go back to normal. I mean, you definitely need to pick up the pieces and sort of figure out one, how not to have another one. (laughs) And two, like, you know, you, you have to look at the circumstances that are sending you into that sort of mental state. So I would just say that, that like, for me, what really helps avoid stress with this job is I have to have a hobby. I have to be at least somewhat engaged in some other generally creative activity. For me, it's guitar. Like I'm taking guitar lessons right now and at night, instead of waking up in the middle of the night and being stressed out because I have way too much work and I haven't had a day off in three months. Um, I'm thinking about like, like, trying to work on my technique to like play better, to play faster, to play more accurately, whatever I'm working on some scale or long run that I'm trying to memorize. Um, and, and it's completely disengaged me in any kind of stress about comics, um, which is great. And then the only other thing I would recommend in terms of like stress management is, um, drink a lot of water, try to take breaks if you can during the day and maybe even just go out for like a five or 10 minute walk. Like you could literally just walk around your block or go in the backyard and do some like Kung Fu, you know, moves or whatever, but just get up every hour and kind of get moving for at least five minutes. It's really important. I actually have a guy that I know who's, um, a cardiologist and he's an older guy. This guy's like probably in his early eighties and he's a brilliant, brilliant man. He's like, not only like a great doctor, but he's, um, he's written books on some really, really interesting, um, sort of like metaphysical, like weird shit. But he said, babe, this is cardiologist advice is he said, you should never, ever sit still for more than a half hour, 25 minutes. You need to be getting up and moving to have good blood flow. And the thing is, is the comic book artists were very, very committed to, um, producing work and drawing and you don't want to get up away from the table because it's like it's just going to make your day that much longer but you really need to do it so anyway but so let's get to like hand injuries um and what the the three things i think you need to really watch the most is fine i'm I'm putting x's and stuff like i'm actually going to ink this i this page has been done and turned in and the book is out but uh yeah, so it's it's we're going to talk about hands, your back, and your eyes. So we'll do hands first. So this is what I would say. The only time I, I I never ever have hand problems, and I never have. I feel really really lucky about that. The only thing that I ever get with my arms or hands is if if I so I draw with this hand and and um, the other arm. If I rest it on the desk and kind of grind my elbow into the desk, like for support, sometimes if I lift my arm up, I'll get like that electric shock sensation through my arm. But I mean, it's like, it hasn't happened to me in a few years, but, but that's, that's one thing that I noticed is you have to be mindful of actually both arms when you draw, like don't have one in like a weird position. I sit generally almost like cross-legged when I ink, um, at least one leg is always up and sort of like, underneath my other leg kind of thing. Um, and, uh, it's not wise cause I'm cutting off circulation to my legs when I work. Um, and then the other thing that I found is when I would ink with a brush, I'm going to talk about digital here in a second too. So you, you digital artists are going to get love too. Um, I, a croquil, I, I generally tend to sort of like hold it, not, not tight, but tight enough. Um, you know, like it's just, I have a firm grip, but I'm not squeezing it. Basically it's like, it's supported, but I don't go beyond that. But I definitely found that when I would ink a lot with a brush, a brush, I had a higher tendency to have like what I call a death grip on it. Meaning that the longer I was doing like brush strokes, I tended to just start grabbing it harder and harder. And, uh, this is what I would say is if you do, if you draw for two or three hours and you're feeling discomfort, 
and then you need to sort of look at your technique and, and how you're holding it and stuff like that. But I wouldn't, if, if your hand is bothering you, I wouldn't go longer than, than when it starts to bug you until you figure out what it is that's causing the problem. And if you ultimately need to see a doctor about it, then it's not a bad idea, but I don't think that you need to immediately like rush to a doctor because you drew for three hours and your hand is bugging you unless it really hurts. But, um, yeah, I just don't go beyond that. Do you see what I'm saying? Is like, if you, if you, if you're feeling uncomfortable, um, then, then, you know, maybe work for another 20 minutes and see if it kind of like mellows out. And if it doesn't, then, then take a break and come back the next day and then kind of try it and see if it happens again and, and kind of work that way. And then, um, what was I going to say is, um, for digital, I find with digital, like I have a Cintiq sitting right there and I work on it quite a bit now. And with the Cintiq, um, I definitely get more of a death grip on the, the, whatever, the stylus, is that what we call them? Um, <laughs> uh, and, and I, I'll go into the settings and I, I fuck with the sensitivity so that sometimes it's lighter and stuff like that. But I find that the, the lighter that it is, meaning that you can throw a line quicker and easier without bearing down harder. Um, I don't really like the way the, the line delivery looks. So I generally keep it pretty much dead center, but, um, I've definitely known more artists that have hurt themselves, um, doing digital work than traditional. So for whatever that's worth, colorists, people like that have way more problems than any artist that I know that draw for a living. Maybe your experience is different, but I mean, I'm trying to think of, I only know of two or three traditional artists that actually had career ending injuries or, or near career ending. Um, and one was a back issue that someone had that was pinching a nerve um, that was affecting their hand, if I'm not mistaken. It was something like that. It was, you know, a, a big artist working on a huge book, and uh, it was they had to kind of step away from it. Um, so then the next is your back. So my back would be the, the one thing that I would say, at least for me personally, that, that I've dealt with more problems than anything else. Um, I don't have a bad back. I have injured my back before moving guitar amps and I have, um, two times swinging a baseball bat at two different times, uh, fucked up my rotator cup, cuff cup. I don't even know what you call it. Um, but, uh, so occasionally during the year, it's, a, it's almost always the same time of the year. That's the funny thing is, is right before Comic-Con, somehow my workload seems to increase and, and I'll go into Comic-Con sometimes with kind of like a jacked up back. Um, but I mean, you know, you can hurt your back doing anything. It's, it's not necessarily that you were drawing and you hurt it, but, um, yeah, you really want to be careful with your back. I, I, this is what I would say is get a good chair. I mean, I, I use one chair in my office for literally my whole career. I just literally got my second new chair a, about a year ago. So, but the thing is, is I bought a good chair the first time around. So, so save up and get a good chair because it's like, dude, your, your back and your legs, it's like, you have to be able to sit and draw for tons of hours. So you need something good for that in terms of like desk. I, I mean, I'm not too finicky on the angle of my desk. I don't like it super tilted. Although with the Cintiq, I do actually lift it up, um, at a higher angle, like, like my drawing desk. I think you can see this. I keep my drawing desk about here so that stuff doesn't slide off. But like the Cintiq, I work about at that angle. Um, and uh, maybe even a little more, maybe like that. Um, uh, and then finally your eyes. You want to take care of your eyes. This would be my recommendation, honestly, is get off your phone. Your phone is going to tear up your eyes faster than anything. My eyes were great. Uh, until I actually started really messing around on a phone a lot. And then I found that, that I would, I would read like message boards, like uh, guitar message boards on my phone. And, you know, after a few days of that, I'd be like, Oh my God, my eyes are just beat up. And then, you know, slowly it, it starts to cause, you know, maybe more, uh, long-term damage. But, um, 
Yeah, you want to really take good care of your eyes. It's just so important. And um, honestly, I find that blue lines, actually, like working on these traditional blue lines when I print them out, um, is harder on my eyes than actually working on pencils. Like, the, I don't know if it's the reflect, re, refractive light from blue or whatever it is. But, but um, and I've never heard anyone address this before, but to me, blue lines actually hurt your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds funny. So I actually print my blue lines out in different colors now, slightly different colors, but I like, I, I can't really show this full page, but anyway, um, I kind of print them in like sort of an off green, greenish color a little bit now. Um, and uh, it, it seems to, it seems to be easier to see and it doesn't um, like burn my eye out. Like, like there's something about this color of blue that just, it's like, you know, over long term, it really seems to tear up your eyes. So anyway, that's going to be the first part of the video on um, trying to avoid injuries. And hopefully that gives you at least some ideas and insights. But yeah, if anything's ever bugging you, you need to figure out, try to get to the bottom of what you think is causing it. Like again, me reading on my phone a lot was causing it. Um, the back issues would be, uh, you know, sometimes you just pull a muscle in your back. I mean, stuff like that happens. And then you have to deal with it if you have to work. Um, and then the stress thing, you know, it's like take breaks, realize at the end of the day that, that, um, you know, it is a stressful job, but, but you're going to be okay. And, um, you know, just, I think a hobby outside of comics is really important. And it is an all-consuming thing. I actually, this is, I'll leave it on this. So before I broke into comics for like a summer, I worked for a friend of mine. Um, and uh, we did like furniture repair and like home renovations. So we could, you know, wood, you know, set up wood floors or go in and paint a room or, you know, like uh, even refinish like antique furniture. We kind of did a little bit of everything like in that. And, um you know, it was, it was a hard job, but you know, I would go, I would wake up at like five 30 or six in the morning, go to his house. We'd work, we'd be done by two. And that was it. I never fucking thought about the job after I was done at two o'clock. My brain was my own. And besides the responsibility of having to get up at like five 30 or six in the morning to go do it again the next day, I was done. Art's not like that. It just isn't. You you know, especially with social media now too, it's like, you know, did you do your YouTube video? Did you upload your Instagram? Have you tweeted 25 times today? Are you in a feud with someone on Twitter? Whatever the fuck it is. Um, all that shit is just like tearing at your soul. <laughs> so eliminate as much of that stuff as you can. I'm telling you, all you need to worry about is being a great artist and it will all fall into place for you. And you won't be dealing with any of that bullshit. I'm serious. Just get really good and put out great art and you will have fans and they will love you and treat people with respect and the way that you would want to be treated. And you're not going to have as many problems as you could. <laughs> I assure you of that. All right. So now let's get to crow quill inking. Okay. So crow quill. Um, I'll show my ink well. I think I can pull it up and it won't make a huge mess. So this is what I put my ink in. I've, I've showed this before. So this is just an old kind of crystal, um, like salt thing that you would put like on a fancy dinner table. It's, it's quite covered in ink right now, but this thing is an antique. It's actually like, I probably shouldn't do it, but I actually, I'm adding value to it because I've inked many, many kick-ass jobs with that ink well. Um, and, uh, I talk about my dirty ink or I swear to God, I, I, I never used to keep it in these, but this is the new thing. It's, it's a little shallow, but this is just filthy, dirty ink water that I clean my brushes in. And what I do is I put a little bit of that in my, um, my ink in the morning that's been sitting out all night <laughs> and I dilute it and it works great. So see, lo fi, I'm telling you all this tool talk online I saw a guy the other day. I'm going to share the story as we get set up. I just put some of my dirty ink water in my old ink. I saw a guy asking about Clip Studio Paint, and he was like, what like, what custom brushes do I need to get started with Clip Studio Paint? And I'm like, dude, like, you're already thinking about it wrong. 
You know what I did when I learned Clip Studio, and I just learned it a couple of weeks ago. I finally like I finally really went in and and was like, I need to work in this program because of um, the He Man job that I'm doing because um, the the work is so detailed. Um, and and I just I tried the stock brushes. I tried the G pen. I tried the turnip pen. And and I would bounce back and forth initially between the G pen and the mapping pen. And ultimately, I like the mapping pen best. And it was it was done. I've got all the friend and brushes. I have nine hundred friend and brushes. I have got the other guy set that did the real nice set. And it, it it's like just settle settle on something and get going. The searching for tools thing, it's, it's just like, I get it. Some tools are better than others, but great technique. You could give a, any guitar to Jimi Hendrix and he'd fucking light it up. You know that. <laughs> he doesn't need the Fender Strat with the specific pickups that people will pine away for on some message board. So, all right, Hot 102, what we do, I generally go thin to thick with this thing. So I've, I've dipped it in ink, and I'm going to show you something really, really quick. I always do this, is I'm barely, barely holding the nib, and I'm going to go like this. Do you see I'm already getting a line with it? Just the its own weight of it on the paper is making a mark. That's how I know that my ink is at a good viscosity and and that that it's going to flow off my nib well. I don't generally check it in the morning. I can kind of tell if I try to throw some lines with it and it's sticking to the nib, um, you know, then I I know it probably needs a little more water. So sometimes I'll suck out a little of the extra old ink, put it back in the bottle and um and then put a little more water. And then the other thing, um this nib is a, about a day old. I had one that I had been using before for about four days and it was just kind of it wasn't able to draw lines it was weird i don't know what was going on with it but i i almost kind of thought it was the ink um and uh so i switched it out i didn't actually like this nib at first it just didn't seem sharp enough and it was kind of getting sort of a weird kind of mid-range line and um you know after working with it for a few hours again i rule the tool the tool doesn't rule me it's very important i got this this pen nib that's an inanimate object to behave and now it's a great nib or well, aren't you <laughs> uh, hopefully this is entertaining i try to make these videos funny and pretty candid but uh, you know some people are probably going like fuck this guy all right so anyway but but now what i'm going to do is there's a couple of ways that you can sort of throw the line off of it i never really was that aware of 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 it to be honest and i just kind of like I would make my marks, but you can turn it to the side a little bit. And, and I'm sure there's, there's people that watch this video. They're going to know way more about this than me. <laughs> they won't have any art online, but they'll, they'll know more about it. <laughs> so I can get kind of a thinner line when I turn it to the side a bit. And some people may even ink all the time with it this way. I don't know. And, and, and so I'm just barely, barely touching the surface of the paper. And I'm not really – I'm not gripping this very tight. But, again, I am kind of flicking with my wrist. So – and and I noticed the video last one was a little dark. So the lines looked a little more heavy-handed than they are. These are very, very fine lines. But my camera tends to sort of um, dim a little bit. So it was making everything look kind of weird. Um and, uh, but yeah, so now as I, as I do it, if I think of it almost like a brush stroke and I go thin to thick, thin to thick, thin to thick, do you see how I can increase the thickness of the line? So now I have a tapered line. I don't normally, like if I was coming out of a black, I don't really find this way works that good. I can do it. It's just not as comfortable for me. Um, but it, it does work. But, but what I, what I do do is I actually will do these, um, kind of more Terry Austin, Alex Garner, uh, and I think even Brad street or, uh, Tim Townsend uses these, um, sort of the more blunt edge lines. So, you know, I can go like that. So I'm just going, I'm keeping the pressure more even, but I'm going thin to thick. So it's like very light touch, very light touch, pressing down a little more, a little more, but I'm trying to keep the line fairly consistent weight. So the whole stroke, once I push the nib and it touches the paper, I don't vary the stroke. And when I'm done with it, I'm just done with it. I don't flick it off so that it gets thinner and it creates um, a very steady weight line. So, 
and then you can flick like your little second line through it and it's a nice little waggle like a waggle pattern and you know I mean you know sometimes you have lines that go through it and that can create like a little bit of a fade but um so we had talked about the blip blop so the blip blop you know you can kind of draw it flick it and then do that it's a really really attractive line it's just got a lot of character to it and um, again, when you work with rapidographs and things like Copic multiliners, the tool doesn't inherently do stuff like this. Like if you draw a line with a Copic multiliner, you're going to get a line that's going to look a little more like this. You know what I mean? It's a line. So again, because I know I want something like this, I could take a Copic multiliner and sculpt the little thing, push down hard, flick it, and then do the thing. And, you know, your size may vary. You, you can do them really fine or, you know what I mean, like... So it's a real nice uh, effect with them. And then, uh, let's see. Um, yeah, like if you were going to render like here, so so I can go like this. I'll, I'll, I'll just throw a set of lines in here, you know. Kind of getting like a point with them. And then I can, again, I can do this second flick. I, I start about... A third into the line like if, if you if you had the line and you divide it into thirds the the second line kind of comes from about a third in and then goes down to about the base of the next line so like if you had this and it was like here's the third and this is the next line you start right about here and you go like that and I generally keep that line pretty thin and consistent but these other the first pass of lines is kind of more of a consistent uh, I mean a uh, uh, that's the one that, that will vary and go from thin to thick, like in here, you know. So I'm, I'm actually coming in with the line thinner and then ending with a heavier stroke. Thin to thick, thin to thick. Light touch, press it down. Light touch, press it down. Light touch, press it down. And then again, about a third in, you know. And I, I sometimes will do it with a brush or even with a nib where I actually do like a scissor move. And, um, you know, you can, you can actually do it. I don't know if my brain will, will, will talking and doing it. Cause it, it actually takes a little bit of concentration, but it's like, you go like this and then back like this and back. You have to be careful though. When you go back on the nib, um, uh, you can spur the ink and it'll flick ink. So <clears throat> there are some directions that a croquel doesn't like to go as much, but anyway, so you've got that sideways stroke, which again, inherently is a thinner, but you can still get your varied line by pressing down on it. Now, how I always used to ink with, um, as I almost run my fingers through soaking wet ink, is I always used to kind of really approach it from like almost like a dead on. So like this is the back of the ink, the back of the nib to me. I've never really seen people work with it this way, just to be clear, like where the, um, if you're looking at it sideways, like this side, I've never really seen people flick lines this way I don't know if that's you're probably not supposed to do that <laughs> um but but I always used to work with it pretty much dead dead center um you know and and again you can kind of sculpt the lines and uh yeah there's a lot of improvisation that goes on when you're inking a page I mean you, you figure you know a piece like this even though this isn't like the most detailed page um you're still putting down several thousand lines so there's a lot of opportunities for you know, like a thin line and then a thicker line next to it and, you know, something like this. And you'd probably fill that in with a brush, but, you know. And you can, um, another thing that I used to do is uh, kind of collapse the line in on itself. I sort of did it here, but um, let me try to think if I can do it. I'll, 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 it's like almost like a reverse. So it's coming around. There's a lot of wet ink on the page, so I'm like losing my, my angles. But you know what I mean? You can kind of have it almost literally um, uh, sort of... It starts like this angle and ends at this angle. So almost like if it was a clock, it would be a... Uh, seven o'clock and end at the angle where the hand would be pointing almost like at 11. Um, you have to be careful of that because again, you're starting to indicate form. When you start turning lines at weird angles or placing lines at weird angles, um, you're, you're, whether you know it or not, you're, you're suggesting form 
and your line patterns and stuff like that do actually matter to that. So let's try this. Um, sorry, <laughs> I had to get into the drawer. I'm gonna push this forward again. So this is kind of an intimidating technique. My, I use, um, this is an inking triangle that I broke, meaning on purpose. I actually, um, I had one break one time on accident and I love the size of it and actual um, kind of monkey grip that it gets when it's broken. So it does have an inking edge on it, but uh, I also taped this little card on the um, thing. The only thing I would say, though, that, that this was a bad move is it is actually handy to be able to see completely through this. This one you can see is quite dirty. I actually need to get a new one. Um, but you would be better off maybe putting something small like um, pennies or dimes or something like that so that it's elevated, but you can still see through and, and really kind of monitor what's coming up underneath. So... This actually, in retrospect, was probably not the best idea, but, um, you know, anyway, but so uh, these aren't in relationship to the piece underneath, to be clear, but like if you have to do speed lines, um, uh, what you kind of want to be aware of is you want to be aware of a vanishing point. So we're going to say that this is a vanishing point that all these speed lines are going to go to. I wouldn't normally do it in ink, but um, so I get a decent amount of ink on my nib and I go like this, push down and I flick. And I rotate it a little bit and I push down and I flick. And in theory, I don't really need to pay attention to the vanishing point, but you may. But, um, uh, you know, you want to just keep kind of rotating it a little bit and try thin and thick and, and just kind of get used to um, that motion. And uh, you could get some really, really nice speed lines. I think that I, what do they call them? I saw some guy do a Clip Studio uh, video on them, and he had a different name for them, which I thought was... I mean, it's kind of, I think, what the program calls them. There's, like, two different names. There's, like, Action Lines and something else. I'm not saying it right, but... But, yeah, if I push down really, really hard, there's the the chance that you could actually have ink kind of bubble up underneath. I'll show you the result in a second. Let me... Uh... And there's a way to do this with a brush too. It's way harder. I think it's it's probably to me one of the most complicated techniques to do, which is where you actually free hold the triangle above the paper and use a brush. That's hard. I I the the guy that I had met originally who was an inker could do that. And I was like, I still to this day I would I would personally probably avoid it. So it's a tricky move. <laughs> But you can get nice, big, thick. People don't, I mean, I don't see speed lines as much in comics these days. No, you don't either? I don't know if you could hear my cat. All right, so let's see. But anyway, but you know what I mean? You can get some pretty nice, like, lines that way. And uh, the more the merrier. People love detail. That's the one thing that I see, like, on my Instagram. It's very, very apparent what people respond to. And <laughs> and they like, they like they like fine detail. The problem is, is that to try to do a monthly book and do that fine detail is very difficult to do it all the time. But anyway, so hope that that helps you. I apologize that I cursed so much in this video. I was very passionate about the content. And uh, I hope that that helps you have some ideas with the Hunt 102. Um, you know, it's a really fun tool. It's a little intimidating. And speaking of injuries, yesterday I stabbed myself with this thing. So that was not fun. But occasionally, you know, you reach into the drawer and it's aiming towards you and it does it. Here's one more thing that I do, actually. Come think of it. Is like Ryan has a lot of like action lines that he does on his stuff. And so what I do is I kind of create like a little triangle. And this is like a brush stroke, actually, that I just mimic with the thing. Um, but. Yeah, I create like, uh, like, I don't know what you call that shape. You see that? I used them a lot on Finch, but I kind of draw like a triangle or a diamond shape. And I flick off of it. And they're pretty cool looking. <laughs> and they they look better small, obviously. But yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a thing that you can try. And you can do these these speed lines with a French curve, too. As long as you have an inking edge on it, same deal. Like, when you see people with beautifully, like, curved lines that are all kind of, like, going the same direction, it's done traditionally. Um, they're probably using a French curve in, in either rapidographs or these. And you can do that same technique with different size microns or copics or whatever. You know what I mean? Like, if you, you're scared. It's a little harder to get the, the taper, but... Um, 
you can't do it. You just have to flick it. It look it has a little bit of a different vibe though, for sure. Um, but but if you're not seeing the ends of the lines, meaning like if it's something behind Batman's cape, like there's just speed lines all behind him, then it, you can actually just use like a Copic or something like that because it's it's not necessarily a tapered line, but more the effect of this, just that vibe of like lines. So, all right, have a great day and uh, don't injure yourself and uh, take it easy and have fun and enjoy October. All right.